Thanks, Rob. Once when I was preaching in a tiny church in Liberia, uh, there was a choir that if the preacher paused for more than a second, they would burst into song. Uh, Doxological, certainly. Uh, I had to learn a whole new style. Uh, Reformed preachers don't have a good record with preaching apocalyptic literature. Uh, Many of our heroes of the past and the present have largely ignored that genre. Calvin wrote a commentary on the book of Daniel, but left the book of Revelation untouched. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, three sermons on Revelation, four on the book of Daniel, compared to 232 on Ephesians and 366 on the book of Romans. John Piper, six sermons on Daniel, 18 on Revelation compared to 113 on Hebrews and 339 on the book of Romans. What is it with Reformed preachers and the book of Romans? Enough already. Yes, it's a great book, but 300 sermons? What can I say? And and when we have preached it, we haven't always done so well. Uh, The well-known Welsh preacher, graduate of this institution, uh, Jeff Thomas, is one Reformed pastor who has preached all the way through Daniel, uh, but I have to say with somewhat mixed results. Uh, After an excellent sermon on Daniel 7, to which we'll return later on, uh, he comes uh, to a sermon on Daniel 8, which he gives the stunningly attractive title of The Ram and the Goat. Uh, The bulk of the sermon is an ancient history lesson about Alexander the Great and Antiochus Epiphanes. And then we get this rather abrupt transition. So it is to the rise of this figure, to which Daniel will return again in the book, which is at the heart of this vision described for us in chapter 8. The normal Puritan structure of a sermon ended with a climactic section entitled Uses, which consisted of application of the passage to its hearers. There are at least five uses uh, in application of the last couple of verses of this chapter, he says. It feels to me as if Jeff got this far and, and feeling how far away his sermon was from the lives of his people, knew he had to do something, but wasn't quite sure what to do. So he went into auto-Puritan mode with the, these five uses. One, the Bible is true. Two, God will defeat those who rise up against him, including Antiochus. Three, seal up the vision means to treat the Bible as something important. Four, Daniel was overwhelmed by his vision. So also when the word of God comes with power, it is draining and exhausting for the preacher, not a matter of jumping and laughing. And five, Daniel went about the king's business, so also you and I should carry out our lawful calling day after day. This, we have to say, is classic Puritan preaching at its worst, giving us general truths that could all be supported by some passage of Scripture, but many of which only have a rather passing connection with the present text, except perhaps number two. It enables the sermon to be practical, to be sure, but not at all apocalyptic. Now, in Reverend Thomas's defense, I have to say that I think conventional seminary training leaves you largely unprepared for preaching apocalyptic literature. At least that was the case for me. Even though I had great professors during my time here at Westminster, and I had a class on General's Epistles and Revelation and another on the prophets that helped me to understand the books better in terms of an academic understanding of the text. We all knew whether we were A-mill or post-mill or pre-mill and why. But nowhere in our seminar education did anyone address the issue of how do you preach these books in a way that respects their literary genre? In practical theology, we had classes on basic sermon preparation, how to find the big idea of the passage, and so on. We had a class on preaching Old Testament narrative. We had a class on preaching doctrinal texts. But it seemed to me no one was even asking the question, how do you preach apocalyptic literature in a way that takes account of its particular genre? And if you look for books to help out, you won't find much either. General books on preaching from the Old Testament tend either deliberately or accidentally to omit this genre. 
Donald Gowan explicitly avoids discussing it, saying there's not enough apocalyptic material in the Old Testament to make it worthwhile. Okay. Uh, Sinigridanus largely ignores this in his major works, the modern preacher in the ancient text and preaching Christ in the Old Testament. And even in his book on preaching Christ from Daniel has only two pages on apocalyptic. Thomas Long's otherwise helpful book, Preaching in the Literary Forms of the Bible, should be renamed Preaching in Some of the Literary Forms of the Bible, since it has nothing to say on this topic, although he has at least contributed a separate article on the subject. No one seems to want to touch the subject of how do you preach apocalyptic, with the exception of a few Anabaptists and Catholics. If apocalyptic really is the mother of all Christian theology, as Ernst Kazemann famously suggested, it seems that few of us want to listen to Mother preach. In this short talk, I want to give just a few suggestions on how to preach apocalyptic, and in particular, how to preach it doxologically. Since I earlier suggested that all of our preaching should be doxological, that feature should also be a hallmark of our preaching of apocalyptic. We know, surely, that there is more to these texts than warnings about a supercomputer in Belgium nicknamed the Beast that has all of our social security numbers. But what is that more? Well, that more, I'm going to suggest, focuses on the sufferings of Christ and the glories that will follow. Doxology, just like the rest of the scriptures. First, though, what is apocalyptic and what's it for? Uh, We can start with an overview definition. Biblical apocalyptic is a heavenly revelation of the ending of this present age, which is an age characterized by conflict, and its replacement by a final eschatological age of peace. This revelation is unfolded in complex and mysterious imagery and has the purpose of comforting and exhorting the faithful. Let's unpack that definition piece by piece. To begin with, biblical apocalyptic is a heavenly revelation. Apocalyptic is, as its root in the Greek word apocalypsis suggests, a revelation, an unveiling of things that are normally hidden from view. Typically, it takes the form of a first-person account of a revelation that has been received through an intermediary, whether a divine or angelic being or a glorified human being. The prophetic word typically comes to the prophet from God to be delivered as a message. Thus says the Lord. Whereas apocalyptic often comes from an angelic mediator. Sometimes the human author is caught up into the heavenly realm in a vision. For the prophetic oracle, the central image is the word, which is why the standard prophetic introduction is the word of the Lord came to whoever the prophet is. Therefore, the primary mode of prophetic discourse is logical speech. Come now, let us reason together. In most prophetic discourse, there is a logical train of thought that can be studied and unpacked. To be sure, prophets do sometimes use riddles or extended metaphors or perform sign acts, but overall, they tend to be in service of the oracle, of the spoken word. For apocalyptic, however, the central image is the vision. I was caught up and I saw in visions of God. To put it in courtroom terms, whereas the prophet is the prosecuting counsel, the visionary is a witness. Here's his sworn testimony. Believe it or don't believe it. Apocalyptic is much less uh, rationally interactive as a genre than prophecy. And the content of that heavenly revelation received by the apocalyptic writer is the ending of this present age and its replacement by a final eschatological age of peace. Whereas prophecy frequently looks forward to salvation or catastrophe within the boundaries of this world, apocalyptic looks for a fulfillment that transcends space and time. The prophet says, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Apocalyptic says, I saw new heavens and a new earth. It holds out no hope for a gradual improvement in society. It cannot look in the mirror and say, in every day and in every way, we are getting better and better. Rather, it foresees a cosmic event that will bring to an end all existing realities and replace them with a new transcendent 
world order. Nothing less than new creation. And what's more, this future cosmic event is fixed and unchangeable and certain to come to pass, no matter what human or spiritual forces may attempt to frustrate it. Unlike Jonah's Nineveh, which repented and enjoyed a reprieve, there will be no reprieve from this judgment to come. The clock has been set and is ticking down and cannot be stopped or reset by anyone or anything. The new world of peace is unstoppable. By the way, that's one of the things that Hollywood does not get about apocalyptic. It's why Hollywood never makes truly apocalyptic movies. This was perfectly illustrated in the Disney movie Armageddon. You know, the very title references the final battle in Revelation 16, when among other judgments, you have massive hailstones poured down from heaven. In the movie, on the other hand, you have a bunch of wildcat drillers sent up in a spacecraft to divert an asteroid the size of Texas from impacting the Earth, in which mission they, of course, succeed. Spoiler alert for those who haven't watched it. But you see, for true apocalyptic, no human effort can ever avert the coming transformation of the heavens and the Earth, not even one involving an all-star team led by Bruce Willis. The coming of this glorious age is unstoppable. Now, in contrast with this future state of bliss, the present age is an age characterized by conflict. Apocalyptic literature is sometimes termed crisis literature because it takes a very negative view of the present time. This era is a time of ongoing cosmic battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. The issues are fundamentally polarized. There can neither be compromise nor peaceful coexistence. On the one side, you have the forces of darkness and rebellion, led by fallen angels and evil human beings, sometimes even the Antichrist. On the other side, you have the supernatural forces of good, with those who are God's holy ones rallying to defend the cosmos against the attempt of the wicked to dissolve it into chaos. Now, the purpose of apocalyptic is to open doors on these normally unseen elements of the battle between light and darkness. Now, the position is not argued as if the writer wanted to persuade us that in Niebuhr's terms, we should adopt a Christ-against-culture position. No, it's just assumed. It's, It's presented as a matter of fact. For the apocalyptist, it's not paranoia to suggest that the world is out to get you. As a Christian, it's simple fact. That much, in his mind, is self-evidence. What is not so self-evidence, but nonetheless just as real as the fact that there are also unseen forces of good all around you, and those forces of good will ultimately triumph. Our earthly struggles are a reflex of that grand but often unseen heavenly conflict, and one that has a sure and certain outcome. And this revelation is unfolded in complex and mysterious imagery. It's a truism, really, to note that apocalypses typically employ strange and complex imagery. The biblical books of uh, Daniel and Revelation are known to most believers precisely for such features as bizarre composite creatures, complicated number schemes, seven bowls, seven seals, a thousand years, 144,000 saints, giant locusts, weird beasts, and so on. We may sympathize, even though we don't agree with George Bernard Shaw's remark that the book of Revelation is a curious record of the visions of a drug addict. Whereas prophetic visions are often simple and self-explanatory, apocalyptic visions are routinely complex. They require the services of the heavenly interpreter to be understood even by the visionary himself. Daniel does not always understand what he sees, sometimes even after it's been explained to him. Apocalyptic visions employ and develop in creative ways all kinds of biblical allusions and references which expect you to understand the connections that are being made. And then finally, apocalyptic literature has a consistent purpose, which is to comfort and to exhort the faithful. The good news of apocalyptic is that in spite of the present depressing appearances, the decisive battle has already taken place in heaven. 
the forces of light, have won. You see, this acts as a corrective to pagan propaganda, which insists that the status quo will continue on, unchanged and unchallenged forever. In the face of that proclamation, apocalyptic responds with a proclamation of its own. Our God reigns. His kingdom will ultimately triumph. And that news serves to comfort the faithful in the present times of suffering and difficulty. And it exhorts the believer to continue to be faithful no matter what the opposition. Apocalyptic is precisely not an opiate for the masses that enables them to endure pain passively in a drowsy drug state. No, it is a cortisone shot in the knee for a football player during halftime, the halftime break that enables him to play on through pain in the knowledge that his team is on the verge of a great victory in the Super Bowl. Accommodation is not an option. Resistance is the only way that is open. Not to side with the forces of light in the struggle is to surrender to the force of darkness. Clear and sharp boundaries are drawn between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And the faithful are urged to watch carefully lest they be deceived and find themselves outside the line. So apocalyptic literature is by no means a counsel of despair. On the contrary, it proclaims a theology of hope to those who have been marginalized in this world. It reminds them that God is on his throne and he will ultimately triumph. And in the meantime, whatever the cost in terms of suffering, obedience is the only way. Though the propagandists for the present world order, like the Borg in Star Trek, Proclaim that resistance is futile, you will be assimilated. The apocalyptist refuses to be assimilated. He will fight them on the beaches. He will fight them in the streets, in the hedgerows, on the land, and on the sea. He expects nothing other than blood, sweat, and tears. But he will never surrender. Because he looks forward to a final vindication on the day when God acts decisively to bring in his new and final age of salvation. Well, if what we've just presented is an accurate overview of the nature and purpose of apocalyptic, what would it mean to preach that apocalyptic literature apocalyptically uh, in a way that's faithful to the genre in which these truths come to us? Well, let me suggest some guidelines. First, an apocalyptic preacher teaches his congregation that this world is not your friend or even a neutral, innocent bystander. Apocalyptic springs out of situations of great trial and oppression for the community of believers. It's no coincidence the book of Daniel comes from the Holocaust of the exile. Or the book of of Revelation, whether you date it in the 60s or the 90s, comes from a time when Christians were being persecuted and oppressed. Apocalyptic does not necessarily come from the margins of society, but it always comes from a section of society that feels itself to be under assault. Such a situation of felt oppression uh, will lend itself naturally to the adoption of apocalyptic rhetoric and thought forms. It's no coincidence that apocalyptic has found a welcome amongst African Americans, amongst feminists, amongst liberation theologians and fundamentalists, but not among mainline liberals. Now, what do those four former groups have in common? Almost nothing except the feeling that someone is out to get them. They all know that this world is not a friendly place, but a place to be viewed with suspicion and concern, even in its most benign moments. Of course, all this seems a long way from the comfortable pews of middle-class white America, where many of our Reformed churches are located, which could be one reason why apocalyptic and reform does not seem to most people to be a natural match. But in a fundamental biblical sense, it is true for all of us that this world is not our home. It's not neutral territory. Jesus puts it this way in John 15, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first, If you belong to the world, it would love you as as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. 
Remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you in this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Second, an apocalyptic preacher assures people that God is not impassive and uncaring. On the contrary, he notices everything that happens and he cares deeply. The archetypal cry of the apocalyptic saint is the cry of the martyrs in Revelation 6. John sees under the altar the souls of those who were slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. And they cry out to God, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our bloods? And the key point is that their cry does not go unanswered. To be sure, God does not reply, well, roughly 2,175 years, give or take a day or two. But each receives a white robe and is told, be patient a little while longer. The theme of theodicy is never far below the surface of apocalyptic writing. How could it be in the midst of a holocaust when you see your friends thrown into a fiery furnace and you yourself are thrown to the lions simply for being a faithful witness? How can you not wonder, God, what are you up to? So be sure Daniel and his three friends survived their ordeal through a miraculous intervention. But in how many cases was it not so? How many faithful saints did not leave the lions hungry? How many who were were slain in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes for refusing to eat pork? How many ended up as personal lighting standards in the pleasure gardens of Nero? How can you not cry out in that situation? How long, O Lord? Once again, our, our comfortable location insulates us from much of this tension, much of the time. When you have a nice house, a nice wife, 2.4 nice kids, nice job, generous retirement package, why would you cry out how long? You're quite happy for God to wait a while because life is good. But there are other times when this world does not look quite so good. When the evils of rape and murder, racial injustice and sexual abuse, kids killing kids, not just pagan kids, but good Christian kids, you you start to wonder when you sit with a mother who's struggling against cancer, cannot find a comfortable place to lie. And you watch as she loses that struggle horribly, painfully. When a child is abducted and brutally murdered, when faithful Christians watch as their church is burned to the ground and their pastor executed before their eyes, what then? Does God care? Does God see? Like the disciples in the boats in the middle of the storm, we cry out, Master, we're perishing. Don't you care? But no one stills the storm for us. There is no voice from heaven, no happy ending here on earth. But in the face of the worst that this sin-sick, evil world can throw at us, apocalyptic testifies, yes. Yes, God does notice. God does care. God is not distant or absent. He is present in the midst of his people, engaged in the midst of their sufferings. Third, an apocalyptic preacher reminds his people that this world is not all there is. And therefore, you need to measure your life against an ultimate standard. It's not coincidental that apocalyptic writers have often had journeys into other worlds. They've seen into heaven. They've read the end of the story. And guess what? It is not what you see around you. Whether it's Ezekiel's vision of a heavenly temple, John's vision of a new Jerusalem, Daniel's vision of a heavenly court, they have seen for themselves another world, an ultimate world, against which this world will be measured and found to have come up short. What the finger wrote on the wall concerning Belshazzar in Daniel 5, many, many take a lufarsin, numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided, could serve as a fitting epitaph for this entire world order. Its days are numbered and weighed and found wanting and will shortly be coming to an end. See, for the apocalyptic preacher, who God is proves decisive for who we are. 
One of the fascinating features of apocalyptic literature is its tendency to paint vivid pictures of God and the exalted Christ. Daniel 7, 9 to 10 gives us a description of the Ancient of Days. As I looked, I saw thrones set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head white like wool. His throne flaming with fire, the wheels all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Now, have you ever wondered about descriptions like this? When you consider how reticent the Bible is elsewhere to describe God in physical terms. In Isaiah 6, the prophet sees the Lord seated in his temple. But apart from the immensity of God, there is actually very little revealed in Isaiah's description. We hear of seraphim, whatever they are, but the vision of the divine is almost uh, entirely obscured, apparently, by smoke. Contrast that with visions of Daniel or Revelation, even the opening of the book of Ezekiel. There, we not only get heaven described in some detail, we get the vision of God described in some detail. This vision of God is important for two reasons. In the first place, it acts to to assure the veracity of the message. I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen the promised land. You can trust what I say. The vision authenticates the visionary. But second, the vision of God also itself reveals important aspects of God's character, just as had the meetings of God with Moses and Isaiah. The Ancient of Days is a wise and holy judge to whom all flesh must give accounts. God's identity is determinative for who his people are and for their ultimate future. But why such a detailed vision, both of heaven and of God? Now, this is something that I think has confused many people with regard to Ezekiel's visionary temple and uh, John's new Jerusalem. Why so many details? Why such specificity unless these are supposed to act in some way as a blueprint for some literal temple or literal New Jerusalem with these dimensions that is yet to come? I think the answer lies in this point, that the apocalyptic preacher tries to demonstrate to his people that the world to come is more real than their present experience. Apocalyptic tries to paint the real world, which is the world that is to come, in glowing technicolor images, in video format against the insistent audio track that this world constantly plays in our ears. That's hard work. Normally, our senses are filled up by this present age. Our eyes see this world in all of its glory. Our ears hear its siren songs. Our lips taste its sweet fruits. Our noses are bewitched by its perfumes. Our fingers revel in its caresses. Or when life goes badly, as it does, often for those to whom apocalypses are written, our eyes are filled with horrific images, saints burning at the stake. Our ears cannot shut out their screams. Our lips pucker at the world's bitter taste. Our noses filled with a stench of burning flesh. Our fingers flinch from its awful harshness. Either way, for better or for worse, this world seems terribly real, incredibly in your face. And so how is the apocalyptic preacher to convey the greater reality of the world to come? And the answer lies in these detailed and graphic descriptions of the true nature of this world and the world to come. Apocalyptic preaching is not for the insipid or the genteel. The apocalyptic preacher is willing to risk offending people by using compelling, startling, unsettling metaphors and images. It is graphic and shocking in its depiction of the true reality of this evil age and the glorious blessedness of the age to come. Apocalyptic preaching grabs you by the throat and yells in your face. It paints a picture of sinners hanging by a thread over eternal flames, one slip and they are gone forever, and you can't help but feel their danger. The focus of apocalyptic preaching is the crucified, resurrected, enthroned Son of Man, Jesus Christ. 
you know, it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone here to hear that the focus of apocalyptic is Jesus Christ. We've already argued that that's the focus of the entire Bible. And when Jesus explains that uh, focus of the Old Testament, uh, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, we are not to assume that he left apocalyptic to one side. No, the heart of apocalyptic is the crucified, glorified Lord. But though this may seem painfully obvious in theory, in practice, If you analyze sermons on apocalyptic texts, there is often no obvious focus on Christ. And that's probably particularly true in terms of Old Testament apocalyptic texts. After all, it's hard to preach through Revelation without repeatedly returning to the lion who turns out to be the lamb that was slain. Some people seem to manage it, uh, often by focusing on Middle Eastern oil fields, communist Chinese, exact chronology of end times, and so on. But it's not easy to do. But in Daniel, especially outside Daniel 7, with its clear reference to the one like a son of man coming on the clouds, it's not nearly so easy to see how to preach it in a Christ-centered way. It's very easy for the apocalyptic sermon to become simply a history lesson of the past. The fourth one is, of course, Antiochus Epiphanes, who you all remember from your high school history classes, was part of the Seleucid dynasty, and so on and so on. Or a history lesson of the future, The passage shows clearly that in the days ahead, the Libyans will unite with the Russians and the Chinese and march on Israel, armed with helicopter gunships. Remember those locusts with the sting in the tail thing. And even in Daniel 7, I think it's easy to get sidetracked. The angel sums up the interpretation of of the entire vision in two verses. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever forever and ever. Notice, Daniel asks, what's the vision about? The angel says, this is what the vision is about. That means if your sermon says this vision is about something else, either you're wrong and the angel is wrong. I'm going with the angel. Hope you are too. But then Daniel, like most of us, wants to know more about, well, what about the fourth beast and the little horn, right? You haven't explained those. And so the angel says, okay, okay, a little bit, yeah, a little bit about this. Now, Daniel, let's get back to the main points of the passage, verse 26 to 27. The court shall sit in judgment. His dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion, the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom. All dominions shall serve and obey him. In other words, the main point is the certain triumph of God's kingdom, which means the inevitable salvation of God's people. Praise the Lord. Doxology, right? Your labors, your suffering will not be in vain. Of course, we can see how that finds its uh, fulfillment in the suffering, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the exaltation of Christ to the right hand of the Father. Apocalyptic preaching respects and reflects the cosmic dimension of the struggle by means of dependence upon God and constant prayer. Uh, One thing apocalyptic is not going to give you is 10 practical tips to strengthen your spiritual walk. There's very little practical teaching in apocalyptic, which is, I think, one reason why contemporary evangelical preaching tends to struggle with this material. On the contrary, the decisive place of activity in apocalyptic literature is the heavenly spiritual realm, not here on earth. Our eyes are unduly apt to be taken up with the nature of the church on earth, whether we're exulting in our achievements or in despair over our failures. Apocalyptic, on the other hand, draws the covers from our eyes so we can see the heavenly conflict that rages behind the scenes. This is the decisive area of battle, which human struggles only mirror dimly. Daniel 10 speaks of the conflict between a a heavenly being aided by Michael, Judah's prince, and the corresponding figures from Persia and Greece. And in the face of such overwhelming cosmic figures, Daniel is reduced to a quivering heap of jello, flat on his face before them as though he was dead. Daniel 10 verses 8 and 9. Surely, weak mortals like him and like us have no part to play in this crucial cosmic struggle. This is surely a battle for God and his angels alone to fight. Or does Daniel have a role after all? 
Isn't that precisely what prayer is? The bizarre yet thoroughly biblical notion that we weak, fickle, frail human beings have an impact on the course of events in the earthly and the cosmic realm through the uttering of a few words. Not, of course, that history is holding its breath waiting to see what we will do, right? God is not, contrary to popular evangelical opinion, the great quadriplegic in the sky. You know, he has no hands except your hands. He has no feet except your feet. He has no mouth except your mouth. No! He is perfectly able to do everything he intends to do. But even so, in a real sense, we take our stand with God in the face of the onslaught, and our standing firm, our enduring, is of real significance in the cosmic scheme of things. That's why Daniel's apocalyptic vision includes a whole chapter of a rather liturgical prayer, while the pervasive scent of heaven is the smell of incense, which explicitly represents the prayers of the saints. Indeed, the angel is sent to Daniel explicitly as an answer to his prayer. But funnily enough, what we see when apocalyptic literature draws back the curtains of heaven for us is not what some popular spiritual warfare gurus told us. The angelic activity in heaven does not resemble a Frank Peretti novel. There is not a cosmic command center directing angelic forces engaged in hand-to-hand combat with Darth Vader-like forces from the dark side. What we see is the angels engaged in worship. In Revelation, the camera is constantly cutting away from the frenetic and confused picture here on earth to a peaceful heavenly scene where an eternal worship service is in progress. In the Bible, worship and warfare are often closely linked. Both begin with the sound of the trumpet. And the conquest of the promised land under Joshua likewise jumps regularly from one activity to the other or merges them completely, as in the destruction of Jericho. So the apocalyptic preacher will encourage his people to see that in the face of a sin-sick and dying world, the present as well as the future belongs to those who praise God. An essential goal of apocalyptic preaching is to leave people move to worship. Indeed, the heart of the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, is the worship of God. That is the presently, present heavenly activity that occupies the angelic hosts, as Revelation 4 and 5 so vividly depicts. Yet this is what so much preaching on apocalyptic texts fails to do. We say confidently that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And yet we preach as if the chief end of man is to live an upright moral life with a mind stuffed full of doctrinally correct ideas. Don't get me wrong, morality is good. Correct doctrine is is vital. And, And nor are morality and doctrine unimportant to the writers of Apocalyptic. Just read the letters of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. The risen Jesus is offended that those in Pergamum tolerated those whose doctrine and practice is unacceptable, contrary to the gospel. But it is also concerned about those who, even though they work hard and do not tolerate the wicked, do not make false claims of apostleship, have forsaken their first love. They have lost their passion for God. How tragic. How will they possibly endure the trials ahead without an undimmed passion for God and a consuming desire to worship him and him alone? Doxology is, after all, the ultimate subversive activity. When we worship, we are publicly declaring God to be everything to us. The evil empire will tolerate many things in Christians, provided they're willing to bow down and worship the beast as well. The beast has no ultimate quarrel with morality or even correct doctrine, so long as it never engages our hearts. But when we worship the true God, we are inherently reordering our thinking. We are focusing more on heavenly realities and less on earthly things. We are focusing on who God is and not who we are. We are reminding ourselves that God is not impassive. God is not dead, but is vital and real. And above all, he is present with us. 
This is powerful stuff, the stuff of which revolutions and reformations spring. Worship is the ultimate apocalyptic act. And that's why the preaching of apocalyptic has to leave people's eyes focused on Christ, the crucified Lamb and exalted Son of Man, who reigns even now in heaven, and who will return to vindicate his saints at the end of all things. Often we read uh, apocalyptic literature as if it's telling us the end is nigh. Oh, the people who wrote apocalyptic wished the end was nigh. Apocalyptic is written to help you because the end is not yet nigh and may not be nigh for a while. There may be more to endure. Come, Lord Jesus! But in the meantime, as we await our king's return from on high at the perfect time of God's choosing, which is not open to human inspection, we pray and persist in faithfulness and we suffer if God calls us to that. But above all, we worship. We join the saints. We join the martyrs in heaven in affirming our God's worth above all things and that our God is worth whatever our discipleship costs us. That brings us, in closing, back to Jeff Thomas's other sermon, the one on Daniel 7. Because it is this doxological note that in this sermon he captures so well And I can think of no better way to conclude this talk than with his conclusion to his sermon. God does, according to his will, among the innumerable company in heaven, yes, but the beast too must do what he bids. The greatest events in world history are to be judged by him, yes, and the smallest things too. Every idle word evaluated by him, nothing overlooked. We must all stand before this great throne. And sitting upon it will be this Son of Man. And all our comfort on that great day will derive from the one fact that the one who died to be our Savior is sitting on the throne. The one who will vindicate us is the Lamb who on Golgotha bore our sins. The beasts have no choice in obeying obeying Him. For them the yoke is not easy, nor is the burden light. They too must give account when they will bow before him. But his people cry with longing, Maranatha, even so, come, Lord Jesus. This is the message that comes to Daniel at a time when the word of God seemed consigned to oblivion in Babylon. uh, Sovereignty belongs to the Lord. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the richness and diversity of your word. And we thank you for the beauty of the apocalyptic literature that faces us so powerfully with uh, the reality of uh, the brokenness and lostness of the world in which we live, the antagonism of the spiritual forces against us, but the safety of your people in the bosom of Christ and the glorious future that you have prepared for us along with all of the saints. Lord, we pray that we would treasure these uh, parts of the Bible, that we would learn how to understand them well, how to apply them to our own hearts and lives, uh, and uh, how to teach them to others in ways that will leave all of us uh, caught up with the majesty of the vision of of the God whom we serve and the fundamental reality that our God reigns. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.